God bless, God bless. I do want to thank you guys for tuning into I Restore Radio for part two of the testimony. Um, yesterday, the testimony was like an hour long, and I decided to cut it short because um, it, it just made sense. Um, but I do want thank you for coming back to listen to part two. Um, I hope that you do share. I hope that you do invite someone else to listen to this testimony. Um, when God brings us through things, it's for, uh, for other people to learn from you know, other people's mistakes and their trials and errors. Um, I do want to thank you once again for tuning in to Redeem and Restore podcast. And this is the full testimony. This is part two. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into prayer. Spirit of the living God, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the ending. Lord God, you are so gracious. You are amazing, majestic in all your ways. There's no other God like you. I give you glory and honor that only you deserve. I thank you, Lord God, for sending your one and only begotten son to die for me on Mount Calvary. He was sacrificed so that I may be redeemed. He was sacrificed so that I may be found, Lord God. I thank you, Jesus, for laying your life down for me to find mine. I thank you for laying your life down for that I may get redeemed, Lord Jesus. I pray that the blood of Jesus enter through this podcast, that it enter hearts and minds, Lord God. That everything that I have gone through, Lord Jesus, is to help someone get through their situation, Lord God. To help any young woman that have gone through the same situation that I have gone through, through marriage or through low self-esteem or being living a lifestyle that is not pleasing or according to your laws. Lord God, please, Jesus, please touch someone, Lord God. In Jesus' precious, holy, and matchless name, I pray, amen, amen, and amen. Thank you once again. I cannot stop thanking you. Um, it's definitely a privilege and an honor for God to use me to uh, create such a platform as this. Um, all glory goes to God, and our honor goes to God, too. Um, I do want to continue the testimony, and the reason why I'm giving this testimony is because three years ago um, on, on Passover, that is when I created a new covenant with God, that I hold this covenant till today. Um, I didn't hold it. Actually, the, the blood of Jesus allowed me to hold the covenant. Um, so we're going to go ahead and pick off from where I left off, and I was speaking, and I, you know, I explained to you guys in the first testimony how um, I was married and how everything transpired and how everything quickly escalated within the marriage and how um, I met this guy and I fell for this guy and I committed adultery on my marriage and um, I basically wanted to get revenge, right? And I ended up losing everything. And um, and I that from that mistake, everything just spiraled out of control. I began to live a life that was not pleasing to God. So... Um, I did get to a point where I did get tired um, of living that way, and I got to a point where, you know, I just felt like a piece of meat. Like, I was tired of going on dates. I was tired of talking to people, different people. Like, I just, I, I, my, my body was tired of it. So, I decided to start to go back to church, and I will never forget this. And one day, it was the youth revival at the church. And I, I believe it, it may have been the last day or the day, the, the day, the last day before last, should I say, the day before the last day, should I say. Um, and I received a prophetic message that if I do not return back, that something bad will um, happen to me. And I mean, I received the message. Um, I quickly got on my knees and I, I submit in front of God and just ask for forgiveness. And, um, you know, I, that's one thing about me. I never decline any prophetic message. I always receive them and I always pray on them. So um, I, I tried to change. I did make an attempt. Um, I, you know, I know the thing is that I know. I know the word of God. And I know what God is calling me out or how he's calling me out to serve him. I know that the wigs, I couldn't wear it. The, the braids, I couldn't wear it. The fake hair, I know I couldn't wear that. So that's one of the first things I had let go is the, the fake hair. And I stopped talking to the guy that I was talking to at that time. And, and um, you know, he came back around. And he tried to seduce me. I, I stayed strong. 
And I tried to persevere. I tried. Um, I even brought my friends to church um, with me as well. And we tried, and I tried. But I couldn't take it anymore. Like, I felt like I looked so ugly without my lace wig. And I grabbed that lace wig, and I slapped that lace wig on my head. I'm telling you, there's something about lace wigs. They're demonic. They give you this false self um, confidence that is very demonic as in just like um not to go off topic just like the whole movement of self-love that self-love movement is demonic by the way it is definitely governed by spirituals entity spirituals like you know jezebel or the sun goddess and um when people say my face is beat to the gods those are like the sun goddess those are like the greek goddess that you're that you're beating your face to and when people be saying that like when i first heard that i was like only if they know they paying homage to those those sun goddesses like uh venus the, the goddess of venus and i don't know if you guys ever heard about the slot the slut movement and basically it's okay to have abortion it's your body and it's okay for you to be fat and, and you know, and walk around naked. It's okay for you to, to dress like a whore. And no man has a right to judge you. Nobody has a right to judge you. All that movement is demonic and it's leading you into the path of destruction. I just wanted to include that in here. And, yeah, so i i slapped that lace wig on and man i i started getting this confidence out of nowhere like i'm like listen god i can't do it <laughs> i'm bored my phone is dry i'm not getting no play i am not going out to dates i'm not doing anything i am bored and i slipped back into the world and you know i started to do the things that i normally do i started to drink again the second thing i did was drink again and um I started drinking again, and I, you know, picked up where I left off. I went to strip clubs, and I went to Haitian parties. I went to Haitian clubs, and um, the strip clubs, let me tell you something. Even though I went to the strip clubs, I never felt good about looking at those girls. Like, I don't go to the strip clubs to look at the strippers strip or dance. Um, I always feel bad for them because... Let me tell you, those strippers are talented. The things they be doing on the pole, they need to, like, enroll in gym gymnastics. Like, they really be working. It's not just twerking. They do more than twerking. That they, the things that they do, how they stretch their bodies, their flexibility, they can, they could have been an instructor for gym gymnastics or something. I don't know um, <laughs> what they could possibly do besides gymnastics. Uh, maybe, like, I don't know like a PE teacher or something. But the point is, when you go to the strip club, these girls literally be sweating. They naked, everyone looking at them, and they on these poles doing all these type of acrobatic gymnastic move that is very complex. And at the, all of that, at the end of the day, when they're done with their, um, with their routine or whatever you want to call it, they have to get on their floors like a dog to pick up their money. And everybody just watching them picking up the money. And that always hurted me. And I'm like, man, like, that hurted me to see a fellow sister degrading herself. But she degraded herself. They, de they, they degraded themselves in one way. But I was degrading myself in another way, right? So, um... But it was it was hard to watch, and I when I go to a strip club, it's just to hang out. Um, nowadays, strip clubs are a place where people go hang out. It's not it's like it's more than a perverted guy going to meet his perverted needs. Like people literally go out and hang out for some weird reason. Strip clubs always have like the best food. They have the best food, blue cheese, the best chicken wings. I don't know why, but especially in Miami like strip clubs or the spots where people just go hang out they don't even go for the strippers like that they just go hang out because that's where everybody be at and um i i remember we went to atlanta and we went to atlanta we had like hotel parties uh like a hotel party you can say a hotel like the the property that we rented 
it was more like an apartment style. I don't want to say like hotel. And we like, you know, we had a hotel party and we went to a strip club over there. And I, I, I just continued living that lifestyle. So, um, just to fast forward, because I don't want this testimony to be as long as the other one. Um, uh, I'll continue to live this lifestyle. I, I remember avoiding my mom because I didn't want her to see the way I was living. And I, I know it would break her heart uh, to see that I have a nose ring, to see that I have tattoos. And I remember when I went to go get my tattoo, I was drunk. And my initial plan was to get just some flowers. But I was so drunk that... <laughs> I was so drunk that I keep telling the guy, I want this, I want this. And to a point now, now I have like a half a sleeve. And I was supposed to get more. I my, At first, I was just going to do a half a sleeve. And then I was going to like, I mean, I'm just going to do a whole sleeve. And I'm going to color it in. And once I got home, and I had like three different sessions. In each session, I was drunk. Each session, I was just adding more stuff. I was adding more stuff, more stuff to my tattoo. And then um, one day... The last session, I was like, Stacy, this is out of hand. You need to stop. You need to stop. And I just looked at my arm, and I, I, I just instantly regretted. So I didn't want my mom to see me like that because I know that would have sent her to the hospital. That would have, <laughs> it would have definitely broke her heart. And um, so here I am. Time go by just to fast forward the testimony because I don't. It's these to my testimony is so long, I I can't like tell everything. But I, I pray that God tell me what's more important for people to hear. And time went by, and one day I was working at Sprint, and I was upset over something, over someone. Someone did something to me, and I was really upset what that person did. So. I went to Wine and Spirit, that's on Biscayne, and I bought me a bottle of this clear liquor. It was um, it was like a cucumber flavor. I don't remember the name of the bottle, but I, I remember the bottle shape. It was like a cute shape. And I was on a budget that day, so I couldn't get any Hennessy or any, um, any of the other dark liquor I normally get. So I bought it and I got drunk. And that day I got a message from this guy that has been pursuing me for the longest. I mean, this guy had been pursuing me for three years. And I never took the initiative to connect with him because this guy was so disrespectful. He was slick out the mouth. He was fresh. I mean, when I first spoke to him, I first met him. He was really slick, and I was like, I'm not going to deal with this guy. It was just something off about him that me and him didn't connect. And so I was drunk, so now my good sense is not here, and I'm just texting him, and he's texting me, and he first texted me from WhatsApp, and he was like, hey, um, you're not going to give me that chance to be in your life? And I'm like, okay, I'm drunk, I'm tipsy, whatever. I'm going to entertain the conversation. So I, that night I spoke to him, we were texting, and eventually I think he called me, and we were actually talking. And while we was talking, I was like, oh, I never gave this guy a chance. He's not that bad. He's real, He's still rude, but it's not that bad. Like It's like he was blunt, and I like people that are blunt. So, But he had that in him. Well, he made it seem like he was blunt anyways for the most part. So time goes on. We met up. And he had supposed to be this guy that was his brother, but really to come to find out, it was his cousin. So we're going to call the, the brother, brother cousin, since that's how he introduced me to him. And I hooked the brother cousin up with one of my good friends. And so we did like a double date thing. Something happened. Come to find out the brother cousin had a woman and it was drama and everything, you know. So I continued to talk to my guy. And he actually moved in with me now because he was going through a crisis and he had nowhere to go. And I said, you know what, come on in. You can stay a month and get back on your feet. Worst decision I ever made. And when this guy moved into my house, that was the prophetic message 
that I got literally six months before that if I do not turn around, something is going to happen to me. He was that something. So moved this guy into my house and automatically within the first month, the first thing he did was destroy my friendship with all my friends. It was crazy. That's the first thing he did. He made everybody go against each other. And it was so crazy how everybody, like this girl wasn't talking to this girl. This girl wasn't talking to this girl. And I was in the middle of it. I was, I was still able to talk to everyone. I ain't had no problem with no one around me. But everyone else around me had a problem with each other. And it always pointed back to me and him or majority him. He separated my friends. No, Now, nobody want to hang around with me. No one want to come to my home. Like, nobody just don't want to be around me because of him. That's the first thing he did. He got me to himself. And the second thing I realized, I realized that he had something about him that he, he had this gravity pull. And this gravity pull make you submissive towards him and I realized that when we go out that women cannot look at him in his eyes and they begin to blush and they begin to like shift it was just something about him that allowed women to be submissive towards him and I thought I was the only one that noticed this and I was like maybe that's just me tripping um, cause sometimes girls could trip like that around a man, you know? And I said, um, I don't think I'm tripping. I know if it keeps reoccurring, like that's just something weird. And it happens to people. Like if you're a Christian, it won't happen to you. But if it, like, if you are not a Christian, it will happen. And I, I realized that. And someone else brought it up to my attention and they say, hey, you know, sometimes they're, you know, the Haitian parents, they, they do things to their kid. They charm their kids so that their kid can have luck or for they, the, their kid can always have a woman or always have a man. And the person was like, maybe his mom charmed him when he was little. He got something about his eyes that when a woman looked into his eyes, he captivated the woman, he charmed the women. And I was like, it kind of makes sense. You know, it kind of does make sense. And um, I kind of like brushed that off. And let me tell you, when you are in darkness, you don't have no discernment. You don't have no good sense. Even if God give you warning signs, the warning signs are like green light. <laughs> like you don't have no good sense. And another thing I want to tell you guys, there are people that are actually the agents for Lucifer on earth. They are in human form. They have human history, but they're not humans. And sometimes they know that they're the Lucifer um, agents, and sometimes they don't know they're Lucifer agents. And make sure you always pray to God about your partner, whether it's a man or a woman. Make sure that God is the one that's sending you this person, and this is your partner that you are destined to be with. To continue on. So everything could have, that could go wrong went wrong with this guy. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. Like he just brought so much of a bad energy to my home. I began to lose my car keys. I was always spending $300 for my car keys. He would lose them. Everything that he touched turned black. It could be as white as snow. Soon as this man touched it, it get destroyed. I'm starting to get my car towed. My car, my car is starting to be repossessed. I am starting to able not to pay my home no more. While he was there and he was working, he couldn't never keep a job. He couldn't never. I mean, this, sometimes this guy did a job for two days and get fired within the second day. Or he would have a job within a month. Like he was complete destruction. Like and I would just be walking, exercising, and my feet would just break. I would fall. I would constantly go to the hospital. Things were constantly happening to me with this guy. And on top of that, I'm always catching him cheap. 
And I'm like, uh-uh, we cannot be together. And I would tell him, let's get in the car. I'm going to bring you to Pompano where you came from because this is not going to work out. I was like, you have this black cloud that's hovering over me, that's hovering over my home. You're bringing all these bad energy. You, you break me and my friends away. My friends, we're not friends anymore. I'm by myself. I'm not with this. You're talking to all these girls. I'm not with this. Get in the car. I'm going to bring you back to Pompano. Literally, every time I bring this guy back to Pompano in two days, I will go like pick him up. I'll be like boohoo crying on the highway and i don't even drive highways like i'm afraid of highways but i'll be on that highway and i and i'll forget that i'm afraid and i always get off of exit 30 38 or 39 one of those exits I, I i forgot but i know it was like 30 something exit and i always get off of those that exit to go to pompano so it was so weird because every time that i would drop him home he knew that I was going to come back. He had a nonchalant demeanor. Like, yeah, you finna come back. <laughs> he would be in a car chilling. Just nodding his head. Yeah, you finna come back. And lo and behold, I came back. I always come back and get him. And people were starting to say that he had complete control over me. And I used to get so offended when people say this man had control over me. I'm like, no, he didn't. He don't have no, he don't have no control over me. Oh no, he's not controlling me. And people was like, yes, he is controlling you. And they were right. It's to a point that he controlled my whole home. I didn't know where nothing's at. I didn't know where no pots or pans was at. Like I would think the pots was one place and he misplaced them. I would be looking for my blow dryer. I would have to ask him, hey, do you see my blow dryer? Do you see my clothes? Do you see this? Like, he had complete control over my whole house. When I'm looking for something, I have to go to him to ask him where is that thing. And time go on, I'm having such a miserable time with this guy. And one day, I felt super sick to a point that my muscles heard it and I couldn't walk too well and I said I'm gonna wait two days if I still feel the same way I'm gonna go to the hospital and I did went to the hospital after two days because I was still feeling ill I got to the hospital I was admitted for three days but while I was admitted they kept me there they're not telling me what is wrong with me they're not telling me why I'm not able to walk and why my muscle hurts and finally, the last day, they told me what was wrong with me. They dropped the bomb on me. The worst news that I could ever got in my life. So I called my friend, Samantha Andre. Oh, I should have never said her last name. Her name is Samantha. I called my friend, Samantha. And I explained to her that I'm in the hospital and I need someone to bring me home. I can't walk and I'm on a wheelchair. They wheeled me out of the hospital um, to her, got in her car, she took me home, and he was there. He made some tea for me, and he would watch me drink the tea. He knew exactly what was going on, and he knew exactly why he gave me that tea. But at the time, I didn't understand. And, I, and when, as he gave me this tea, he would be looking at me to make sure that I drink the tea. And one day I told him, why are you always watching me when I'm drinking the tea? Like, what is about this tea? What are you putting inside of this tea that you want to make sure that I'm drinking it? Red flag. And I'm still not understanding. It's like, I will understand for a little bit, but then the next day, like, I'll forget all about it. Like, I just don't, I just didn't have no sense. So one day... After I got better, um, I was able to walk again. I, I, it was been like a month. Um, at that time, I didn't go to work. And the only reason why I went back to work is because my boss was like, hey, we gave you a month off. You need to come back or we're going to replace you. And I understand that you're going through a crisis right now. And so I didn't want to lose my job. So I had to go back. So I went back to work. And thank God I did because if I had stayed home, I would have became, I would have been crippled. And he, he calls in all of this too. By the way, he caused all of this. So 
I went back to work and I, it was just never the same. Life was never the same for me ever since, you know, that, that time that I got hospitalized. Everything was had changed. And I just had this, like, black cloud hovering over my life. I was just becoming more depressed and stuff like that. And one day I had a dream. I had a dream that disturbed me to my core. I dreamed that I was at my own funeral. And I was watching everything unfold. I seen my soul sitting on top of my casket. I had a brown beige looking casket. And as my soul was sitting on top of the casket, I was just looking around to see who was in the funeral. And the church was like a big church. It was full of people. And I said, I don't know that much people. Like, I don't have a lot of friends. Where are these people coming from? Like, who are these people that are, that are attending my funeral? And I was looking around and I said, I hope they didn't put no picture with me with fake hair on with any type of weave. I hope they put a picture that I have my natural hair. And I, I found the picture. It was in front of my casket, like right next to the casket. And it was a picture of my natural hair. And I said, good. And like, I was happy. I see my soul happy because of that. And then I see my mom sitting next to my friend. And, and that's exactly how it would have been. Like she would, she would have been sitting next to my mom, my friend, my best friend. She would have been sitting next to my mom. And um, I see her sitting next to my mom. And then I seen the guy that I'm with in a dream, but he didn't come to the funeral yet because he was on his way to the funeral. He was inside of a taxi. And when he was inside of the taxi, he came inside of the funeral. He sat down for maybe one minute, it looks like. And when he came and sat down, he took my soul. My soul went with him. And he, he left the funeral. And he got in a taxi with me, with my soul. And he was making it seem like he was kind of afraid of my soul. Like he was kind of uncomfortable. And I said, why are you afraid? I'm going to be with you forever. Everywhere you go, I'm going to always be with you. Everywhere you go, everywhere you turn, I will always be with you. I woke up from that dream so disturbed. And I said, something is up. I wanted to wake him up so bad from his sleep, but I said, I'm not going to do that. I wanted to tell him about the dream that I see you, you're doing something but I said, I'm not going to do that because he has something about him that he made me tell. Like, he, he can make me tell him everything. And I'm not the type of person to tell people everything. I always tell you a little bit, half, or I just don't tell you. And he always make me tell him things. Like, he, it, I don't know what he does. I don't know how he, well, now I know what he, you know, what he's about. And I understand why I was always such a chatterbox with him. And I said, I don't want him, I don't want him to know that I see him. So I'm gonna observe him some more because maybe that's just my imagination. Time goes by, things are still getting toxic. Like me and this guy would fight every single day, every day we would argue. We would have big arguments every day to a point that this guy got me so angry. He gets me so, so angry. And I will be picking up pots, pans, brooms, coffee makers, whatever. And I'm just throwing it across his face. I'm just throwing it across his room. I'm always fighting, slapping him. And it's, it's so much energy to fight every day. I just was so tired. And I felt so trapped because I couldn't leave him no matter how much I want to leave him. And the days that I made the initiative to leave him for real... He would come in my house. I remember one time I took two weeks to not talk to him. I was so strict on my decision. I came home from work. I found my bed was done. <laughs> he bought me a new guest bag and he bought me a teddy bear and he put it on the bed. And I was, I freaked out. I said, my house is not safe. 
I don't know if he broke into the door with a knife, he went into the window, or if he just walked through, or he teleported through the walls, because this man is not human. He came in my house. And you would think that, I, although I was freaked out, you would think that I would not talk to him. Lo and behold, I fell for him again. And here I am, going through it all over again. I'm still losing my car. Like my car had been repossessed. If it hasn't been repossessed like four times while I was with this guy, I don't know what is. And the fights are getting worse to a point that I remember we got into a fight. I had a crack on my window. That was because of him, me throwing a bottle, and a bottle hit the window, and the window cracked. And he was just a womanizer. He was a cheater, liar. And I, and, I, and, I, and I be thinking to myself, I'm like, Stacy, why are you taking all this from this man? You didn't even take this from your husband. You didn't even accept this from your husband. Why are you taking all this from this man? And I had a second dream. The second dream I had, I seen this woman was bent over on the ground. But I couldn't see what she was doing. And someone in the dream told me, do you know who this is? And I said, who is this? The voice told me, this is so-and-so mom. She is doing magic. So everything that is in you go to her son. And everything that is in her son goes inside of you and I remember the dream so vividly it was two white bowls and these two white bowls Haitian people like using them white bowls it's like a, a metal type of bowl and the rim be like black and then the bowl itself is white but it's like a metal bowl and then inside the metal bowl was a skull each bowl had one skull and each skull have one picture. My picture was on the left and his picture was on the right. And those two pictures that I seen or the two pictures I seen him send to Haiti one time. I thought he was showing me off to his family. I didn't know he was sending my picture to go do witchcraft. And the voice says, in Creole, Jésus a bon chance. Il va quitter sa rival. Translation, Jesus will give you a chance. He will not let that happen. In Jesus' name. It was a woman voice that was talking to me. I woke up from the dream, freaked out. Another red flag that I ignored. And, I, and when I wake up, and I always be freaked out. But I only be freaked out for like two, three days and I get over it. Like, it, it becomes nothing to me. And I didn't tell him the dream. But literally two days or maybe one day, um, the mom called. But the mom normally calls me. She doesn't call him. And she made it seem like, oh, she loved me. She was always like, T-Sherry, que j'en ai T-Sherry, T-Baby, que j'en ai petite fille. That's how she would talk to me. Like, when she always talk to me like that except for that day and that day she didn't call me she called him so they, he went outside and talked to his mom he came back inside and gave me the phone and the mom was like and I was like okay and then and then I was like, why is this lady talking to me like that? And I, in my mind, I was, I literally was confused. I'm like, what did I do? I'm trying to figure out what did I do to this lady for her to talk to me like that? And then a thought came in my head and I said, do you think she know I had the dream? I say, no way. And I was like, how, how could she know I had the dream? It's my dream. It's inside my head. 
Like, it's my dream. How can she know I had a dream? And then I kept saying, the dream, the dream, the dream. It makes sense. She probably seen that whatever she did was blocked. And it didn't happen because the person in the dream did tell me that in the name of Jesus, it's not going to happen. So now she's mad. And whatever conversation she had with him outside, they talked about it. And I was like, oh, my God, everything makes sense at that moment. And till today, I am speaking to you. I have not spoken to her. Even if she had reached out to me, I have not spoken to her. Like, I, I do not speak to that lady ever since that day. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm in hot water. Now it's starting to sink in that I'm in hot water. So, of course, although I'm starting to realize I'm in hot water, I'm in sin, complete, utter darkness. I don't have no discernment, no common sense. And I can't talk to no one like that. I can't go to my mom because she doesn't approve of me living with this guy. She's not going to want to hear it. So I'm just literally here by myself. I don't have no friends because he made sure he destroyed all my friendship. And he got me where he wanted me for me to be lonely for him to do what he wants to do with me. But there's a God in heaven. There's a blood that was shed for me on Mount Calvary. And he could have not done what he wanted to do with me through his grace. Through God's grace. And time goes on and I'm starting to really be, really be curious about him. And he had tattoos. I always seen tattoos on him. But, you know, I had tattoos. So I'm not going to like too much question the tattoos he had. But one day I started to get interested in his tattoos because... His tattoos look like they had meaning behind them. He had this creature that looks like a bird and an eagle on his arm. And I told him, why did you get that tattoo? It looked ugly. And he told me a story. Now, this is his story that he told me. Because I was pers at first, he didn't want to tell me it, by the way. I was just so persistent. And... Sometime I was trying to get him drunk in purpose just for him to tell me what the tattoo means because I just knew that it meant something. And one day he, he finally broke and he kind of told me. I don't know if this is true or not. Um, but I heard stories of like familiar to this. So it may be true. And someone confirmed something with me about his mom. So, you know, it may have some truth to it. And he told me that his mom was pregnant with him. He'd been in his mom's womb for a long time. And he, I mean, when a long time mean years. Like he said, he was in his mom's stomach for years. And she couldn't get birth. And in order for her to get the birth, she had to go under the water. So I know this sounds strange to a lot of you guys. But in the Haitian culture, we know that morning visit is connected under the water it's like um a worm like a, an underground worm where the demonics and the principality of darkness they created their own world i guess and this is where they reside at and it meets it can meet with the world like our regular world and um one of the passage is through the waters and um and this is a creole called monovisib and in english i guess it's called invisible world i don't know how much, what it's really called but i'm translated in, in in english so she he told me that his mom had to go there and that animal that bird when she went there gave her passage and she was there for like 10 days underneath the water um the firmaments of the skies in between the firmness and the skies and the water and she was able to give birth after she came back from there and he was always told to always give homage to that creature that allow him to give the you know allow him to come through passage and that's why he got that tattoo on his arm to pay homage to that creature and he had another tattoo on his arm that say sergeant and i asked him why do you have a tattoo that say sergeant? Were you in the gang? He said no. Were you in the police academy in Haiti? He said no. I say, were you in the army? He said no. And I said, why you call him sergeant? 
He told me he cannot tell me that. That's like classified information. And I said, in my head, the word legion came to my mind. I say, legion, sergeant. Then I thought to myself, I didn't, t I didn't say this so he can hear me. And I said, you know, sometimes, um, not sometimes, but the demon empire, they have rankings. They have like legions. They have like legions are like the demons that, that have multiple demons in one. And then they have sergeants. They have commanders. They have chief. They have rankings in the uh, invisible world, like the whole principality of darkness. And I said, God, please don't tell me this man is someone from the invisible world. I said, God, please do not tell me this man is someone that that's like one of them. Like he's been like, he's not actually a human. He's been created to, for me to be destroyed. And now I'm starting to get scared. Now I'm like, okay, I'm in hot water for real. This is hot water. And from that time, I was very precautious. Like I stopped drinking teas from him. Those teas that he would fix up for me, I stopped drinking them. Um, I tried to be very careful as much as possible. But it, it didn't make sense because we, we lived in a, such a small home. And although sometimes I'd be comfortable, like today I'll try to be comfortable. And the next day I'll totally forget. Like he really had me captivated. And I remember me saying that, God, you have to deliver me from this situation. Because it, it just got worse. The arguments got worse. The, the loneliness got worse. And to a point that it's starting to affect my jobs. I couldn't keep a job. And although, although I had the dream and the voice told me that God will not let that happen. But I felt that a little bit of flash hit me anyways. Because the same thing that happens to him happens to me. Till today, I still cannot keep a job more than a year. Everything that happened to him is happening to me. I was the type of person never, I rarely get fired from my jobs. Rarely get fired from my jobs. I'm telling you. Now every year I get fired for something. Till today. And I remember... After I had that dream, I couldn't talk anymore. To today, I still can't formulate my words. And I used to be someone that was so smart. I used to be a nerd. I used to be someone that could read 300 pages literally in one day. I used to love reading. I used to love, I enjoyed reading. I'm walking from school with a book in my hand. The only time I put the book down is when I'm crossing the street. I'm in school, I'm in math class, I'm reading. I used to love reading. I used to be so good in reading. I always scored well. I mean, I could not come to school for a whole week. As soon as I get to my English class, I would not get an F or D. The lowest score I'll get is a C, maybe, if I'm not feeling okay. But I'm always a BA student in reading. I'm always, I'm always excellent in reading and pronouncing words and art, being articulate. I was always told that how articulate I was. And all of a sudden, I can't talk. All of a sudden, I'm, I'm on a seventh grade level of speech. All of a sudden, my mind cannot function. I can't process things. I'm always losing my jobs because I start off good and I can't never finish good. It's like my mind stopped processing. And it was just like him. I even spoke the way he spoke. I even start cussing just like him. People would tell me, yo, Stacy, you sound just like so-and-so. Like every time you open your mouth, it's like so-and-so talking. And I'm like, oh my gosh. This, he is really taking over my life. He is consuming me. So time goes on. Just to fast forward the testimony because I don't want it to be too long. Time goes on. And one day, um, I had a dream that he was talking to this girl, and the girl had a son, and 
I didn't take it for nothing, to be honest, because I know that he was always talking to women. So I'm like, whatever. I didn't take it as nothing. So one day he, it was December, his birthday's in December, and he went to his uh, people's house over there in Pompano, and he told me, you know what, um, it's my birthday, I'm going to hang out with my people, and I said, fine, go hang out with your people. So, but in honesty, he went to go hang out with a girl, and the girl, what she did was, she knew he knew that something was up with him, so she took his phone, and she posted her picture on his phone and then when she posted his picture on his phone I seen it and I, I you know I was furious so as soon as he came home I had a 4x4 four four beam I smashed the beam across his back he was so shocked and he got so weak he fell to his knees he started to cry I grabbed his phone I recorded him crying I posted over all social media um, and his job at the time called me and they couldn't get a hold of me or him and they thought that something had transpired, transpired between him um, like maybe you know I did something bad but I didn't all I did was it's just got one good lick and they was ready to call the authorities for me and I and I, I sat down and I was waiting for the authorities I even got I, I went and take a shower I ate and I sat down for the authorities to come because, baby, I had stories for the authority. I have something to tell the authorities. But even that itself is another testimony that I'm not going to include in here. But time goes on. Time goes on from that. And he, I still took him back after all of that drama. Here I am still taking him back. But I started to get tired. And, and I started to feel so drained. And I said, you know what, one day I'm going to die from a stroke. I'm going to die from a heart attack. I'm going to die because I'm always angry all the time. And I just felt so trapped because I wanted to leave him, but I didn't want to leave him. It was just something about him that I just couldn't leave. Like, it was just so weird. I felt so bad if I left him. I felt like he needed me. I, like, I had to be there for him. And it, it was just so weird. And um, one day I was going to work at this time. I was working at this hotel called the One Hotel. It's in South Beach. And I was getting ready for work. And um, I was missing something. There was something that I was looking for that I needed. I think I, I needed an extra white shirt. But I had a suitcase. I normally never go into that suitcase unless I'm about to travel. And he knows that. And that's a perfect place to hide something if you want to hide something. Because I don't go into the suitcase. But as I went into the suitcase and I was digging for the white shirt. I was looking for it because that, that was the color of our uniform. And I remember all my white shirt was dirty. And I remember I had an extra white shirt in the suitcase. I seen this pink silky cloth that Haitian people like using to wrap around their heads. Like whenever like their mumbos or like witchcraft or witches, they like to use that around their waist or their heads. Every time I see them, that's how they use. That's the, that's the cloth they use. This pink cloth was folded in half. In the middle of this pink cloth was a red string that was tied and knotted up really good multiple times. And I said, this is witchcraft. I said, Without a doubt, that this, this is witchcraft. And I have an auntie of mine that re does reside in Haiti, and that's her domain. And I saw her the picture because I wanted answers. And I said, I know this is what you do. I'm not asking you to do any work for me, but I'm asking you to tell me what is this. I wanted her to give me information off of her noggin. And she said, do you have someone that goes into your home? I said, yes, I'm going to be honest with you. I am living with a guy in my home and she said okay he may be trying to charm you as in he's trying to like um like captivate you for you never to leave him and I said okay and I said thank you and uh, we got off the phone and she never told me anything else after that um I went to work when I went to work I asked someone else um this guy because he looks like 
he's probably uh, uh, he's into those witchcraft thing because of the things that he posts. And I said, this is what I found in my suitcase. Do you have an idea of what this is? He says, yes. He says someone is doing witchcraft for someone and there he's like they're basically he's they're captivating you and you won't never be able to leave them and also he says that um like whatever they say you'll do and i said okay thank you for that information and when i went home i finally confronted him about it oh my gosh he said i don't know what you're talking about that's not true i didn't put that there that's not what that mean and blase squaze like he was just if you would have listened to him if this guy he is so good and arguing even though he's lying he sounds right and i was like oh my gosh this guy and i'm like who else could it be it's just me and you in this house no one else who who else could it have been that put this cloth of witchcraft in my suitcase i left it as that and um I said, God, for sure, for sure. If I was in hot water before, I'm in boiling water. <laughs> and I, I started to get concerned. I started to worry. And I, I started to be depressed. And I started to talk to God. And I said, God, do not leave me in this situation. I need your help. And I, I couldn't even pray. I couldn't even formulate any words. Um, I started to listen to gospel music. That's the first thing I did. That's why it's important for gospel singers to stay connected because when you can't find the words, those lyrics is supposed to help you find the words. And I would listen to this song. Um, um, if the, um, how you call this song? The song goes, If the Stars Were Made to Worship, So Will I. Uh, I forgot the title of that song. But that song helped me so much. I would play it over and over and over and over. And my prayer was, God, do not let me die. I couldn't find any other words. Two things I said, I'm sorry, God. And God, don't let me die like this. God, don't let me die like this. One day I had another dream. And I'm a type of person, I'm a dreamer. Um, I've been a dreamer since I was a kid. Um, and I had another dream that I was in a car with him while I was in the car with this guy I was on 163rd and on 163rd in my, is in North Miami Beach for those of you that are not familiar with the North Miami Beach area you're not from Miami um, it's like a place where we had like this, this mall that is there and um Across the street from that mall, it's like a plaza, and that plaza was no longer a plaza in the dream. And I'm in my uh, my red Ford Taurus with this guy, and he was driving a car, and I was in the passenger side. And as we was driving down the street, I realized there was chaos everywhere. I realized people were running. I realized fires were starting to start up. And I realized police sirens was everywhere. And I was just searching around to see if I can just grab someone's attention so they can tell me what is going on. And finally, this girl running naked, and she had ID around her neck. And I say, hey, hey, ma'am. What's going on? And she says that they're grabbing everyone that doesn't have an ID. And as she was saying that, I said, ID grabbing. And I said, oh my God, the NWO is here. And I said, Jesus Christ is coming soon. And I said, Jesus Christ is coming soon. He's coming. And then the girl ran off and she left. And I looked at the guy. The, my ex-boyfriend I looked at him and I said um we have to separate but I said that in Creole and I said il est pour nous séparer si nous we nous encore and I said it's time for us to separate if we see we see and I got out the car and I start running but as I got out the car the police that was not too far off see me running they started chasing me so I ran into the building that 
currently right now it's not a building it's a plaza in that area but now at that time in the dream is it was a building and as soon as i walked into the building i had this person that was there with me telling me everything that was going on in the building so the person said this is the building that they gonna kill and persecute all the christians and this building is going to be like administrative buildings, like official buildings. Only officials could go in this building. And as I went on the first floor, I seen a hat on the floor. And they just came from killing a group of people. And they said, the voice said to me, the person said to me, this is a floor that they gas people to death. And I went on the next floor. This is the floor that they use guns. They shoot people to death. And then I went on the next floor. This is the floor that they used to do. Um, they used um, elect electricity to kill people. And then I said, God, why would you let me run into a building that's killing Christians? And finally, I'm going up to this, the very top floor to the point that I got to the roof. And there was a whole bunch of cars, but the cars were like compact cars. They're not big cars. It wasn't one big car on top of that roof. It was a whole bunch of compact cars. And then the person told me, at the end days, people, officials, are not going to be parking their cars bottom anymore. They're going to be parking their cars on the roof. And I realized every car had like an ID in the windshield. And it was like, at the end day, security is going to be tight. Everything is going to be secure. All information is secure. And at the end days, in order to unlock your car, you have to use facial recognition. There's not going to be no keys at the end day. It's going to be facial recognition to unlock your car. Then all of a sudden, the alarm went out. There was a security breach in the system, and I was that security breach. Now, I can hear... The securities and officials running on the top roof to come get me. And I said, Jesus save me. I say, Jesus save me. They coming to get me. And he changed my face to this Chinese white woman. And my face was able to change. And my face was able to unlock the car. And when my face was able to unlock the car, I went inside of the car. And I drove off. And when I woke up from the dream and I said, Jesus is giving me one last chance. And I didn't hesitate it. I went straight to church the next week. And when I got to that church, I sat in the back of that church and I wept and I cried. And I went again and I cried and I wept and I cried. And I'm just listening to the word of God. And I just, and I'm just realizing my state. I weep and I cry and I went again and I keep crying like every single time that I'll go and I realize how much I made a, uh, how much I made nothing but bad mistakes after bad mistakes, bad choices after bad choices. Although God gave me warnings, although God gave me red flags, I still continue, I still pursue to live that lifestyle. The consequences of sin. It's not easy. It's not good till today. I am still paying for the consequences of sin. The humiliation I got to go through. The things that I have to go through. It's the consequences of sin. I always say this. You cannot lose God's trust and think that God's going to take you back 100%. He's going to take you back. It's going to get to a point that it will be 100%. But in the beginning, it's not. You're going to have to fight really hard. And if you don't fight really hard, you're going to, you're going to be in that path of destruction again. I'm telling you. Anyone that's in the situation that I was in. If you are married, your husband and your wife is not doing their job. Pray fast. Because let me tell you something. If I could go back in time and pray and fast, I would. I don't care what type of fast it would be. I don't care if it was a mango fast. I don't care if it was an avocado grapefruit fast. I don't care if it was a Daniel 40 day, seven days, no eating, three days, no eating, two days, one day and a half, whatever fast it would have took for me to save my marriage. And most importantly, my relationship with God, I wouldn't have done it. It's not about the man. It's not about the women. It's about you and yourself. It's about your personal relationship with God because things that you do affect your relationship with God. It affects it. 
Oh, I'm not going to do this for this man. He found me like this. I'm not going to fast for no man. If he don't want me, let him go. But if he go, can you handle you being single for the rest of your life? Can you handle that? Because you can't get remarried if you want to make it to heaven. If you're if you okay with you going to hell, then you know you do you. Do your thing. It's not a joke. Serving God is not a joke. Like, listen, back then I used to say this stuff. I used to say, ain't nobody finna let me leave God. Ain't nobody finna make me go back to sin. Ain't nobody finna make me. I used to talk big talk. But as soon as my husband cheat, look what happened to me. I had talked big talk, but I, ain't, I couldn't walk the walk. Make sure you can walk the walk. The other day... <laughs> Like I had this like this phase that I was going through where I wanted to be John the Baptist And I felt like God got tired of me with that prayer And one day I sat down and I said God I want to be John the Baptist I'm like I want to be God I want to keep it real just like him You know I ain't with that fake stuff blah 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 And a voice said to me can you handle being John the Baptist Can you handle what it takes to be John the Baptist Can you handle being talked about can you handle being lied on can you handle all these things can you handle people saying that you're a lunatic you crazy can you handle being john the baptist john the baptist god knew that he was going to be picked on so much that he made him live a, a lifestyle apart can you handle being apart can you handle when your family says come to this event and you tell them no i can't go can you handle their, their ridicule? Can you handle those things? And when God told me, can you handle? I already knew what he meant. And I calmed down. I stopped praying there. <laughs> I stopped saying that prayer. Because I forgot. Because just like back in the days, I used to say, ain't nobody going to let me lose God and all this stuff. And then boom. As soon as my husband do something, I'm already going crazy. I'm already going haywire. And I left God. That's why now, and, and now I'm a big chicken. I be careful of what I say, what, what I could do. I don't, I don't go around here and acting like I'm a super Christian. I don't do that because I know that I sometimes I cannot walk the walk right now. And the only reason why I'm on here is to share my story. I'm, the only reason why I'm on here is to tell you guys, hey, be careful because there's consequences of sin. I'm lucky. God gave me that last dream to bring me, make me go back to church. But how about those that won't have that last dream? How about those that won't have that last missionary come to you? How about those that won't have that last evangelist or pastor or prophet come to you? Be careful. So, to continue on the testimony, I'm sorry. <laughs> to continue on the testimony, um, and the whole reason why I, I decided to give the testimony on Passover is because that is when I made the confident with God. So what happened was after I had that dream, I kept going to church and I just kept being convicted. And oh my gosh, God was just speaking with me. But I was still living in the house with the guy. But something was starting to shift. Like I, like he started to irritate me. Like he started to make my skin crawl. Every time I see him, I wanted to just run away from him. Like I didn't even want him to touch me. I just felt so disgusted with him. And... Um, one day I said, God, how can I get rid of this guy? Cause he's, he's, he doesn't want to go. I kick him out. He's still here. I kick him out. I go get him or he comes back. And I, I just feel like I can't leave him. I feel like he needs me. And, um, so I had a thought that came to mind. I said, why don't you take Holy Communion and Make a new confidence with God not to have sex with him. If you if you don't have sex with this guy, he's not going to want to stay. And things are going to definitely not work out with you guys. And I said a good idea. And that day I went to church. And when I went to church, um, as if my pastor was in my mind, she said the same exact thing. She had an altar call. And she was like, people that are not taking their holy communion anything that is stopping you from taking your holy communion whether you're shacking up in a house with a guy whether you living in adultery whether um you're not having sex with your husband whether and whatever it is that's making you stop taking your holy communion come to the front i will put that charge on my back i will take the blame for you 
I will take the blame and put it on me. But the only thing, if you go back and live in that, that lifestyle, the blame is going to go back on you and the consequences on you. But I'll take the consequences and put it on my back. And I was like, man, if that's not a confirmation, I don't know what is. As if she knew what I was about to do. And she don't even know that I was living with a guy. I didn't tell her that I was living with a guy. And I was like, okay, when they have Holy Communion, I'm going to go up. And here Sunday comes. I did not go up to the Holy Table to take Holy Communion. I felt so ashamed. I felt so embarrassed. I said, I cannot come from the world and I'm just coming back to church and I still live, with, I live in a house with a guy for me to go to the Holy Communion table. I said, I'm not going to do something like that. And I was like, what I was thinking. After I got the confirmation, this is me doing logic in my mind. And I felt so ashamed. I felt so bad. I felt so let down. I felt like I let God down. And I remember going home and I said, I'm never going to get out of this situation. I said, I'm going to die like this. Like, I still point out, I, I was starting to, like, settle that I'm going to die like this. And the next month was going to be Passover Holy Communion. And I said, Stacy, this is your second chance. Do it. And I'll never forget that day. I had a burgundy and gold striped dress a high-waisted dress with a burgundy shirt with some um, gold flat shoes and I went to church that day and um, I went to the holy table I take the communion I was really nervous I was shaking and I got back to my seat when I got back to my seat I prayed in my heart and I asked for forgiveness, number one. And number two, I said, God, I'm here to start a new covenant with you. For me not to have sex with this guy, never again, or any other guy, unless that person is my husband and you restore my marriage. That is if, if that is your will. And I said, God, I don't know about the masturbation, but I know that you can hold me. But I was more focused on the, the sex. So I ate the body of Jesus, which is the, the bread. And I drank the wine, which is the blood. I sealed the deal. And when I got home, I had this strength. Like, <laughs> I bust into that door. I say, hey. But I said in the creed, I say, hey. I wish your dear. I don't know if I don't mean to make a bun. And translation, after today, we can't sleep on the same bed. Get on the floor. You're going to sleep on the floor. And he was obedient. He slept on the floor. Matter of fact, weeks went by. He was still on the floor. And I told him, I gave him a month for him to get his money up so he can get out my house. And I was like, oh, that Holy Communion gave me fuss. <laughs> that Holy Communion gave me fuss. And but three weeks went by, four weeks went by. It's a month going by. This man is still on the floor. It's like he was happy that I saw him on the floor because now he can cheat even more. He can he can do what he want even better on the floor. And I said, God, the Holy Communion is not working. What happened? <laughs> He's still here. And so what happened is I got my stuff. I called my mom and I said, Mom, I'm gonna come home to you. I'm gonna leave this guy. And of course, that's what that's what she wanted to hear because um, she wasn't happy that I was with this guy. And I told him that, hey, you're not going to see me tonight. I don't feel well. I'm going to spend some time with my mom. But I didn't tell him I was leaving. So I grabbed my documentation. I grabbed, like, you know, some belongings. Not too much because I didn't want to make it obvious because I wanted to ease my way out the house. And I, I grabbed things that I know that, I, like, I have no business returning. So, um, as I grabbed my things, I went home to my mom, and at that time, my mom' home was, like, occupied. All the room was occupied. Like, she had people living there. Um, my mom was, like, really big on hospitality, and um, 
I stepped on the couch. I said, I don't care. I'd rather sleep on the couch than to be in that house. Like I, I was determined to leave sin. I was determined to get out of the situation that I was in. I was determined to just leave this guy. I just wanted peace. And I said, I don't care if I have to sleep on this couch for the rest of my life. I do not want to be with this guy anymore. That's it. I'm done. I'm done sinning. I'm done guys using my body. I'm done guys using my mind, my gift. I was so smart and I lost all my smartness. I lost all my gift. I lost it all. Like I really lost it all. This guy sucked me. And it's not from all the other things or all the other people I dated before. It was with him. This guy sucked the life. Well, he tried to suck the life out of me. But God is good. So, moving forward. Um, the testimony is so long. I'm trying to move forward because I'm already here at an hour and 10 minutes. <laughs> and this is where God's going to confirm to me that, hey, you were in some hot water. One day my pastor called me and she said that she had a dream. Um, she was really uncomfortable to tell me the dream. And she said, I seen that you were dying. And but as I was dying, she was she took a hat to fan me. And she said in the dream that what happened was going on like that. And I said, and I said in the dream that I went to a witchcraft lady. And, and translation, basically, I, I like to say it in Creole. She said, I went to a mumble, and that is why this is happening to me. But when she told me that, I, I, I said, huh? I like, Because I, I wanted to hear and make sure I heard what I heard. And I was like, I, I, don't, I don't go to witchcraft places. And I said to myself, you know, I know I used to drink a lot. And, but one thing about me, even though I drink a lot, I remember stuff. Even if they fuzzy, I still remember stuff. Maybe I don't remember the whole thing, but I, I remember something. And then when she told me the dream, I didn't snub her. I didn't say, no, it's not true. Because if she had a dream, it, it has to be something. And I said, let me go sit down and relax and, and think about it and rewind to see what could, have, what could it have been. And as I was sitting on the couch, it didn't take me much longer. As, as soon as I sat on the couch, my auntie name popped up in my head. And I said her name. And I said, let me call her. So I called her, blowed her up. And she didn't pick up. I left her a message. I said, hey, I need you ASAP. And she called me. And I said, hey, did you remember the picture I sent you of that cloth that I sent you that I found in my suitcase? And she said, yeah. And I said, you never told me anything else. I didn't want to come out straight out to her, you know. I was beating around the bushes. And she said, oh, um, I did something. And I said, what did you do? She said, moi fait un démon. And I said, okay, me saki le démon. Sorry for the career, démon. And she said, um, and she said she did a demand. I guess that's the witchcraft language, I'm assuming. And I said, what is a demand? And she said, And then she said that, Translation, in English, I seen, I want to go do witchcraft to see what the guy did to you. And she said that, I see the guy did one of the highest degree witchcraft to tie you. And he wanted you to do everything for him. And for you never to leave him. And you will always be there. And I said, oh. And I said, okay. And I said, thank you. And I said, um, but we're not together. And then she told me, yeah, but you, know, you got it together because she went defect to the bad guy. She said, I did, I undid everything. He would never have control over you. But uh, only if she knew that it's the blood of Jesus that took me out of that situation. <laughs> Only if she knew principalities and principalities don't go against each other. Only if she knew Jesus has said this. He said the kingdom of darkness, they work together. They don't bring each other down. They may bring you down and fool you as a human that is using their power and their entity and their, and their forces 
but they work together as a team to bring God people down. And I said, on nom de Jésus, et pas ça qui te démarre, c'est sans Jésus Christ qui démarre. I'm not going to give no witchcraft, buckle. I don't care if you my auntie, cousin, whatever you is. You could have been my own mama. I don't care who you is. Ain't nobody finna get God glory. This is God glory. God single-handedly took me off of that sex bed. He single-handedly took me off of that, that situation that I was living in. And I got off the phone with her. I quickly called my pastor and I told her, you are right. This is what happened. I finally told her I was living in a house with a guy for two years. I was shacked up. And I told her one day on my way to work, I went in a suitcase. I found this. I, I even sent her the picture. And I told her um, I did not tell my auntie to do any witchcraft. I wanted to know what exactly that was because I knew it was something magic. And I just wanted to know exactly what it was. And I sent her the picture and she told me, and I just spoke to her and she told me, yes, she did do work for me. And God showed her that I had work done and he wasn't pleased about that. And, and he showed her that I died. So I was going to die. Like when I had that dream that I was in a casket, I really was going to die. And that dream, she had confirmed that to me. Confirmed that this guy was programmed to destroy me. But God. Hey. But God. But the blood. And that's why Passover is so special to me. Not only that it's special to me because my Lord and Savior blood was shed for me on Mount Calvary. Not only because he carried the weight of my sin on his back. And he didn't deserve that. He left his throne. He left his royalty. He left all his riches. For a wrench like me. For no good like me. For someone like me that, that I deliberately brought myself to the enemy. I told the enemy, here I am, destroy me. I told the enemy, here I am, come kill me. I told the enemy, here I am, come abort my destiny. I sacrificed my own self to the enemy. But God left the 99 to go find that one lost sheep. He left that 99 to go find Stacy. He left that 99 to go redeem Stacy. He left that 99 to go call me where I was at. And today, I Restore Radio is here because of that. Today, I give God glory that I have been celibate for three years. It wasn't easy. God gave me control over my flesh. Oh, it wasn't easy in the beginning. Oh, my God. It wasn't easy. And that's why... Um, it's been three years for I was cel I'm celibate through regular sex, but I, I still um, I think two times I masturbated, and um, if I took a more firmer decision when I had did that covenant, because I don't know guys if you guys can recall in a testimony I was more firm about the sex, but if I were more confident about the the masturbation, it it would have been three years too. But nevertheless, it's two years and a half. Not, you know, it's right, right behind the three years. I get, give God glory for what he's done for me. The transformation. Like I'll get people from my workplace. They'll notice the difference. And, you know, that, that's what it's all about. You, you know, you get transformed for people to notice the difference. And, you know, they'll text me and tell me, keep going. And that definitely encouraged me. And God is good. God is definitely good, and it's not easy. It's a fight. Anybody that say it's easy, I don't know what type of path you're on. <laughs> and, you know, we all have different seasons. Sometimes the burdens are less in one season, and sometimes the burdens can be very heavy in the other. But nevertheless, I want to encourage everyone to fight a good fight. 
This is my Passover testimony. I'm not going to say everything. There's still more things about this guy. So much more things that I could say, but I'm not. Uh, I'll say it in my church instead. But I do give God glory and honor for taking me off the, the sex bed, like I like saying. And I just give God glory and honor. I thank you, Jesus. For everything that you have done for me thank you God for loving me the way you do thank you God for saving me the way you saved me because a lot of women a lot of girls got into the same situation and they didn't make it out alive but I did who am I it's not like I did things for you it's not like I worked for you long enough it's not like I'm so loyal to you because every time things get bad I astray every time things get bad I forget who you are everything every time things get bad Lord God we our memories are so short I don't even deserve what you have done for me but yet you did it for me yet you delivered me I'm still breathing I'm still here it's because of your grace and your glory and I just give you honor and glory that only you deserve. I pray that anyone that's listening to this testimony, may they be blessed by this testimony. May they share this testimony to a girl that is in a situation, that's in a relationship, that she's being abused physically, mentally, that she's being raped. Any girl out there that's being sex trafficking, any girl that's out there, Lord God, that has low self-esteem, any girls out there that's allowing guys to run trains on them, any girls out there that feels that they're not adequate or good enough, any girls out there, Father God, that feels like they can't go to college or university, any girls out there Lord God that feel that they're not loved from their mother or their father any girls out there that suffer any type of mental issue I pray that you speak life into them and not only the girls the boys too touch them let them know that they are men of God let them know that they can be men of integrity let them know that they can be the head and not the tail let them know that they are rulers. Let them know that they are made in your image. In Jesus' mighty name, I give you glory and honor that only you deserve. The blood of Jesus cover every single body that is listening to this. Amen, amen.
Let's go sing right now. He is healing someone. 